Yeah, hey, my okay. So, I guess my slides aren't showing up. I don't know if that's on my end or what's going on there. But hold on, Let's see if we can get this sorted out. Sorry for that. So I guess I'll start. I'm Andrew Lasky. I'm a core developer on Nova. Um, I'm one of the people leading the effort for Nova Cells V2. I'm one of probably five or six people who are kind of key to this effort. There's a whole lot more who are involved in the effort. Um, but I'm going to get up and talk about it. So Nova Cells V2, what's going on? I'm glad you all asked. Um, so I'll start off from the very beginning. Let's just talk about what are cells real quick. Cells are, one, a strategy for scaling. Um, there's two things we may want to scale here. There's the database and the message queue. So if you think about Nova today without cells, you might have a single deployment. You might have 1,000 hosts in it. Um, that may overwhelm the message queue. It may overwhelm the database, depending on what you're trying to do with it. So what you can do is set up cells. You end up with a little bit more complexity in your deployment. You have this API cell at the top. You have a database and a message queue up there. If you have cells v1, you have a message queue up there. Uh, then you end up with two cells underneath that may have 500 hosts each. That means that the database there, the message queue there, only need to deal with those 500 hosts. So you've reduced the amount of traffic and load that they each have to deal with. So that's one part of what cells is. It also provides failure isolation. Let's say you were to lose a database uh, without cells, you lose the database, you lose access to all of your instances, you can't query them. With cells, if you were to lose a database or a message queue within a cell, you can still access everything in any remaining cells. Um, so you, do, you get some failure isolation there. It is also an optional grouping mechanism. Uh, some of the cells V1 deployers, what they like to do is put all of the same type of hardware in each cell. So you might have one cell that's purely bare metal nodes, one cell that has SSD computes in it, one cell that has spinning disks. Um, that's something you can do. It's not required to do that, but it might make capacity planning really nice. It might make um, failure isolation really nice. There's some benefits to doing that. Another thing you can do is scale out deployments by adding a new cell. So you can take you know, a whole new cabinet of computes, stand them all up, kind of deploy everything except the API on top, test them out, run them through QA, send builds there, make sure everything works, and then you plug it up into your production deployment. At that point, it becomes accessible to all of your users, but it, you also know that everything works. You've tested it beforehand. So that sounds great. There's already a cells v1. So why are we doing v2? Talk a little bit about the v1 architecture. Um, it, it works sort of by capturing messages and replaying them. It tries to do this in a very transparent manner. It, it's a really great scheme, but it does lead to race conditions. Um, it was kind of implemented in a really cool way, but there's just inherently race conditions in how it operates because it's not built into the code base in a core way. Um, so that's been a problem. There are two levels of scheduling with cells. You get this um, top level scheduler that has to pick a cell, and then once you're within the cell, you schedule as normal with Nova. The problem is the top level scheduler has very limited data and has coarse data. It only knows that cell A over here has these like flavors available, or this number of slots for this flavor available. Um, so you can't do anything like affinity with it. If you have a host in cell A and you want to build a new host and say, I want it close to you know, this, or an instance, and you want it close to that instance, there's no mechanism for doing that. The cell's top level scheduler doesn't have any information that would allow you to do that. So th there's certain things that aren't there. Um, it's also lacking some of the other basic features that Nova provides. Security groups is a big one. People like host aggregates and availability zones. Um, again, that's kind of tied into the information that the top level scheduler has. 
and just in general other scheduling options that aren't available. It's also bolted on, and this is probably one of the biggest issues with it. Uh, few deployments use it, uh, mostly larger deployers use it, those who have resources they can devote to kind of in hold, holding internal patches to make it work. Uh, a lot of deployers are not, or a lot of developers are not familiar with it. That makes it really hard, one, for people who are pushing patches into sales code to get reviewers to get that code merged, but also people working on Nova in general, they'll add a new feature, they'll forget to add it for cells. Um, that's part of why we have all these features that don't work for cells. Um, there are also a lot of bugs, there's a lot of testing things around it, and we just, there aren't a lot of developers who can really work on it, and that's a problem, and it's because it's kind of shunted out of the way in the code base. Um, it's for the most part very transparent, but also very hidden. It's also difficult to upgrade from Nova without cells to Nova with cells, so if you start your Nova deployment and at some point you're like, you know what, we're really starting to scale, things are going great, I would like to now run with cells because I need the scaling ability that it has, there really is no path for doing that. If you wanna run cells, you really should have started with it from the beginning. Um, but it's also very complex, so we don't recommend that anybody starts with it from the beginning. So you kind of get into this weird situation. <laughs> so the, the lessons learned, um, probably the biggest one is don't duplicate data. Um, there are a number of race conditions that cause real problems for people. It, it's really hard to keep just instance data in particular, um, there's a copy of it in the API cell, there's a copy of it within a cell. When there's task state changes, VM state changes, um, you get messages coming down and messages going up at the same time and things just get weird. Everyone needs to use it. It should be the main code path. Um, that way developers are familiar with it, deployers are familiar with it. You know, it, it stays well tested. That would be really great. The parent cell, for cells v1 still doesn't scale well because there is a copy of every instance at that top level API cell. There's no path forward for that. If you got to a million instances in your deployment, you'd still probably hit your message queue issues for the API cell, your database issues for the API cell. So the v2 architecture, we're starting with some simple principles based on the lessons learned there. Probably the biggest one is data only in one place. We don't ever want to have to duplicate data, and therefore we don't ever want to have to keep the data in sync. If we keep it in one place, it's always what it should be. There should only be one way to deploy Nova. Um, so V2 is going to be the way to do Nova. And we want as little global data, global data as possible in order to keep that top level API database very small. Let's keep as much as possible within the cell. So a little more about each of that. Data only in one place. Um, one, one of the things we're doing to accomplish this is we've stood up this new Nova API database. So any of you who have deployed Metaka have run into this. You're well aware of this by now. So that lives in the API cell. That will store data that we consider to be global, like flavors, right? If some, you go to boot an instance, you have a flavor. That flavor is not specific to any one cell. Um, you know, you, theoretically that flavor could go into any cell, so we keep that data at the top level. There's gonna be other data that's up there. Uh, we don't have that all sorted out now. We're working on that in Newton. Uh, we're actually gonna discuss some of that on Wednesday in the Design Summit. But anything that we can think of as global is gonna live in that top level database. We also store mappings to cells, instances, and computes. Um, I'll get into the architecture a little bit later, but Basically because instance data is not replicated between the API database and the cell database, when you make a request for an instance, we need to know where that instance data is. And so we have a mapping that says, this instance lives in this cell, go query that database, get it, and return it. Only one way to deploy Nova. So it's basically Nova now powered by cells. Um, no more decisions, should we use cells, should we not. Um, we actually probably should stop even saying cells at some point, and it's just Nova. Um, so, And all features will work. Uh, that's gonna be a big one for people using V1 right now who really want that. Um, there's a little caveat, which is NovaNet. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And as little global data as possible, basically we just have these small 
pointers to heavy data in each cell. Um, and as much as possible, we want to avoid putting things in the API database that scale with the number of instances or hosts. Um, so. so putting it all together, here's what cells V2 is looking like right now. This is the path that we're on. You have an API cell at the top. It contains your Nova API services, your conductors, and they have a very specific purpose, um, and your Nova API database and your schedulers. That's all gonna live at the top. You have this kind of special cell zero that you see that's not really at the same level as the other cells. It contains a Nova database, but nothing else. No conductor, no message queue, no hosts, nothing. Essentially because we don't write an instance in the API database, it has to live within a cell. If you encounter a scheduler failure, if somebody tries to boot an instance and all your cells are full, and it says, I can't put this in any cell, we need a place to put that, and that's cell zero. Um, it doesn't actually need to be a separate host. If you don't want it to, you could co-locate that database with your Nova API database, if that makes it easy. Um, but it, we just have this concept of a cell zero. And then you have you know, your cell foo and cell bar. Basically, each cell is you know, conductors, computes, a database, a message queue. Um, you know, some of the other services, the uh, console and some of the other things, will have to work out exactly how those live. But you won't have a scheduler within each of the cells. It's mostly the database message queue and computes. So what's been done? Um, within Mataka, we created a Nova API database. So that's now a second database to be stood up, to be managed. It has its own series of database migrations to get run. Um, and more and more things are gonna be put into that database and migrated into that database, but not, not a ton. We have this concept of database connection switching. Um, you know, if you run Nova now and you go to query where an instance is, it's in the one database that exists. What we are going to need is this ability to say, I have three databases for each of my three cells. I need to be able to connect to this one in particular and pull the data. So we had to write some code to do that. That's merged. And we have a few upgrade tools in place. That just, they're experimental, but they kind of let you play around with it, test it out. Um, they allow us upstream to write some testing jobs that test the upgrades and make sure it works. Um, so that, that's what was done in Mataka. In Newton, there's a whole lot going on. So what has happened already is we've done a flavor migration to move them out of the cell database and into the Nova API database. Um, that was a fair amount of work, but now flavors are up there. That's pretty cool. Uh, currently, I'm working on the boot process and scheduling. What is gonna happen now is when you go to boot an instance, we, the request comes into Nova API we're gonna store some data, enough data that you could list or show that instance, but we don't actually write the instance to the database yet. We have to go and query the scheduler, and that's the job of the Nova conductor that lives in the API cell. It's actually gonna hold on to that data. It's gonna to talk to the scheduler, say, where should I put this instance? And when it gets a response, it's gonna go and write an instance into that cell, and then send the request to do the rest of the boot. Cell zero is in, that's another work in progress. Um, it's mostly standing up a, a database, and this database looks like the Nova Cell database. It's an exact copy of any other Nova Cell database. So it's essentially just standing it up and creating a, a mapping that says, this is cell zero, and we're gonna have a very simple command for doing that. There are more and simpler upgrade tools. Um, there, actually a bunch of them are up for review right now, um, so they haven't quite merged yet. They are much easier to use. Uh, for the most part, it's just one command you need to run and it will set up everything for you. Um, but those are in progress and we're trying to simplify those as much as possible. Uh, message queue connection switching is another one. We have it for the database. We don't yet have it for the message queue, but we need the ability, like with the database, to say, I would like to reboot this instance over here, throw you know that reboot message on the message queue for that particular cell that the instance is in. So that's another patch that's up and in progress right now. There are gonna be more migrations to the Nova API database. We don't know how many yet. Like I said, we're gonna talk about that on Wednesday. Uh, aggregates are one we're pretty sure is gonna move up there. Quotas are another one we're pretty sure is gonna move up there. Uh, 
there's some open questions about other ones, um, like key pairs is another likely candidate, but we haven't quite decided yet. So we'll, we'll keep everybody up to date as that happens. And then we're beginning multiple cell support. Uh, kind of the, the goal for New Newton, I wanna say Neutron, the goal for Newton is that by the end of it, everybody's running cells V2, it looks and acts like a cell. You have a separation between the API and this cell. Um, it's treated as a cell, but we don't yet have all the pieces in place to use the database connection switching, use the message queue connection switching. So if you stood up two cells, some operations might work and some others might not. We might have reboot figured out, um, but not resize maybe. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna start the work on multiple cell support, but we'll see where we get. And beyond. Uh, so after Newton, we'll see where we're at, but some of the things we would like to do is more scheduling control for cells. People who run cells V1 right now have maybe not great control for that cell's top level scheduler, but they do have some control. They can say, you know, I have flavor A only in this cell and flavor B only in that cell. And so when a request comes in, the first thing the scheduler does is rule out half the hosts because it's not even gonna look at you know, whatever cell doesn't have that flavor. Whereas the scheduler that we have for cells V2 currently still just looks at all of the hosts in aggregate. Um, it, it doesn't yet have the ability to say, I have some properties on this cell that I would like to take advantage of for scheduling. So that's something we're gonna be working on. We're gonna finish multiple cell support. Um, you know, that's very important. That's kind of the reason we're doing cells is to be able to have this support. So until that's done, that's what we're gonna be focusing on to a large extent. And we're gonna work on cells V1 to V2 upgrade tools. Um, you have not been forgotten. I know that's a, a huge concern for V1 people. Um, we're trying to get to it, but we have to have multiple cell support working before we can do that. So that's, that's the only hold up there. The upgrade process. For people who just want a simple upgrade, they're simply running Nova right now. They don't necessarily need the scaling aspects yet, but they would eventually like to have them. We have this very simple um, two-step upgrade, but it's kind of actually one step in a sense. But in Mataka, you already would have had to run this new Nova Manage API database sync command. Um, and everybody has to do that simple or not. Then what you're gonna run after Newton is this cell v2 simple cell setup um, and pass in a transport URL. That's actually part of, well, so that will set everything up and it, it sets it up with the um, constraints listed at the bottom, which is basically cell zero. The database is gonna live on the same, you know, my MySQL Postgres um, server as the Nova API database. It basically pulls the config option for that Nova API database and sets up a new database. Um, all active hosts in your normal Nova API database, or sorry, normal Nova database will be migrated, I should say mapped. Um, basically the API cell becomes aware of them. And after that happens, all of the instances that live in that database are also mapped. So the API at that point, you know, it treats it as cells v2, everything's set up. We would like to make this a little bit simpler. Uh, there's this transport URL that has to be passed in. That's because of a, a limitation in the Oslo messaging library. Um, it reads the configuration option and does a whole bunch of magic on it to make things work. Um, so we can't actually, at this point, kind of reverse engineer that to get the transport URL that you configured out in a way that cells needs to use it. So it's kind of required to be passed in. Um, we're gonna be doing some work around that. So hopefully the command ultimately will just be Nova Managed Cell V2 simple cell setup or whatever we end up calling it. Um, but right now this, this will work if a few patches merge. If you need a little bit more of a custom setup, you know that you wanna start scaling a little bit more now and you don't wanna co-locate your databases. You still have to do the API database sync command just to create that API database. And then what you actually do is you figure out where you want cell zero to, to be and you pass in the database connection string yourself and that will do the job of setting up and mapping that cell zero da database. Then you run this map cell and host command. Uh, 
where again, you have to pass in the transport URL and there's a name option which got cut off. Um, but you can actually name your cell and kind of manually make sure that the hosts get mapped in there. And then you can run this map instances command um, and pass in the cell UUID, which you get a return as a return from the map cell and hosts command. But you can run it in a number of stages if you'd like. You pass in this max count parameter. Uh, it's an optional parameter. But you can just say, like, I want to map 100 instances at a time if you don't want to overwhelm your database as you're doing this migration. So as a result of this, all of your active hosts in the Nova database are mapped, and all your instances are mapped. There are a few caveats. Um, one of the big ones is it looks like a, maybe a bad thing, but it isn't. You look at it a little bit more. Is if you, if you live in a multi-cell world, and let's say your database for one of those goes down, and you want to list all of the instances in your deployment, we can't return that data because the database is down. However, we can give you partial data. Um, whereas right now, if you're running Nova and you lose your database, you can't list any instances. In the future, you only can't list the instances that are in that database that's down. So compared to V1, we don't have this, you know, at the top level, we don't have all the information to pass back. But again, we avoid all the race conditions by not doing that. So partial listings is going to be a, a thing that you'll start to see for like the list command, um, Nova list instances in particular. Networking. So I say in progress for Neutron. Actually, networking with Neutron is going to work with V2 out of the box, as long as what you want to do is just have a flat network across all of your cells. That will work just fine. Uh, what's in progress for Neutron is going to be the ability to, they're doing something called segmented networks. Um, it's going to be the ability to kind of tie your segments to your cells if you'd like. So you can kind of you know, split your networking up and say that this cell has this networking and this other cell has that networking. Because most people who've deployed V1 find that their networking is a scale bottleneck as well. And so they end up kind of splitting Neutron up behind the scenes. And there's a lot of hacks in place to make that work for V1. It's not something that works upstream. So we're trying to work with Neutron to get that to be just a recognized thing and something that works for everybody. NovaNet is not really planned to be supported. Um, it, will kind of, it will work with one cell. There's a little bit of work we might do that makes it work. Um, for the most part, with multiple cells, assuming that you're, again, OK with this global flat network across all of your cells, and it's probably also going to tie NovaNet to whatever your first cell is in particular, so that you can never really remove that cell or you lose NovaNet in the process. However, most people are running Neutron now. We're hoping this isn't really a thing, but it's still under discussion. We haven't made the decision one way or another yet. So if we do need to work on NovaNet, you know, we'll go ahead and do that. There's always the unknown unknowns. Um, there may be obstacles, even with cells V1, it's only scaled up to a certain point. I think the most number of cells people have is maybe in the dozens within a, a certain region. You know, if somebody wants to stand up 1,000 cells, we don't quite know what's going to happen there. Um, but we're going to learn. You know, as it scales up, we'll continue to run it, we'll continue to test, we'll continue to fix the issues that come up. So. Cells v2, expected fall 2016. That's it for me. Um, I can talk about anything in more depth if you want. I just want to kind of do a quick overview. Um, but are there any questions? And if there are questions, would you please go to the microphone so that everybody can hear you? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I have a very strong voice, but I'll, I'll use the microphone. <laughs> It also gets recorded, so. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how the scheduler is going to work in reservations with cells v2, or is that out of scope? What do you mean by reservations? So right now, um, if you make with well, cells v1, if you want to build an instance, um, it'll go from the global cell into the child cell. And then um, if there's no capacity there, then it's dead, it's lost. And so there's this concept of host reservations that's being talked about upstream. 
and I'm kind of curious how that's going to play with cells V2. So it sounds to me like the need for host reservations comes from the fact that there's a time lag between when the scheduler within a cell knows that you're out of capacity and when the cell scheduler knows that you're out of capacity. And in cells V2, where you don't have that two layers of scheduling, it seems like the problem just kind of goes away. Right? Like if the first scheduler you go to knows that you're out of capacity, it's not going to say, yes, you can get past here and then fail later. Do you really need that concept of reservations? OK, so that in, ca in that case, then, it's not really something that's um, required or in scope for cells V2. Um, right. OK. As far as my understanding. I'm sure I didn't explain it all that well, that everybody knows exactly what's going to happen. So please, if there are questions. Can you talk a little bit about uh, partial listings that you, you mentioned briefly, but how is that going to work exactly? So let's say you know, you're a tenant and you've created 20 instances across, I don't know, let's just say two cells. And you have 10 instances in one cell, 10 instances in another. And the database for one of those cells goes down. What's going to happen if you say, you know, list your instances is at the API database, we, we know that you have 20 instances connected to your tenant because we've mapped those instances to each cell. We're going to go talk to the database at the, or the database that's up and return all the information for those 10 instances. The database that's down, all we know is that we, you have instances with these UUIDs in there. So all we can really return is a list of those UUIDs and say, this is incomplete. So we can give you all of your UUIDs, but we may not be able to give you things like, this is the flavor that it was booted with, or you know, this is the RAM that it has, this is the metadata that it has. And that would just be if the, you know, if the database was down. It, would be, it wouldn't be in your normal condition. Right. This is only if the database has gone down you know, which hopefully, you know, an operator is going to see that, try to get it back up quickly. But yes, this is just in the abnormal, something has gone wrong case, not normal. I got a question. Oh. I got a question. Okay. okay. Um, you said you eliminated the two layers of scheduling, which is a great thing. Um, when a request comes in, though, how will the API sell? make a determination, the conductor, to pass the scheduling request to any particular cell? The scheduling request does not get passed to any particular cell. The scheduler lives at the API level, right? Yeah, the, the boot request. The boot request. And so then, how does it pick a cell to then get scheduled? Um, so you're saying after the scheduling, how does the boot request continue on to the cell? Yeah, I do a boot request to the API. It's got to go to a cell. Well, the, the boot request goes to a Nova conductor that lives at the API level. Right. So it's going to talk to the scheduler. The scheduler knows about all the hosts in the deployment. It's not picking a cell. It's still picking a host for oh, you. OK. And then once it has a host, we say this host is in cell A. We write the instance to that database, and then through RPC, send it on. OK, thanks. Yeah. If, you lose, if you lose cell zero, do you lose everything underneath it? Or? No, all you lose are the instances that were not able to be scheduled into any other cell. Um, and the, cell zero is really just a holding ground until those instances can be deleted. Right, like, because they're going to be in an error state. They weren't schedulable. All you can really do with them is show them in the API and delete them. So hopefully they won't even stick around that long there for most users. Can you run cells in different versions? So that's a good question. And what he asked is, can you run cells with different Nova versions? Um, I should have put that in the and beyond slide. The the long answer or the short answer is yes. Um, the longer answer is there's some work that needs to go into being able to make that happen because you have to have the Nova API database understand 
how to talk to databases that might have schemas at two different versions, and you need to be able to communicate um, kind of lowest common denominator over RPC for all of that. We have, I've talked with a few people about ways we can go about doing that. We do plan to make that happen. It's a, you know, a huge part of the upgrade story, right? Somebody's gonna want to just take one cell, upgrade it, make sure everything works, and then roll that out across all of their cells. So it is planned, yes. Going back to the scheduler, uh, what about the uh, scheduling based on affinity? Will you be able to do affinity-based scheduling with this approach? At the moment, yes. Um, because again, the essentially what I'm saying right now is that the scheduler is gonna have no concept of cells built into it. Um, it's still gonna know about all the hosts in the, in the deployment. It's gonna work exactly the same way that it works today. Um, essentially nothing changes for it. So affinity will still work at this point, yes. Of a VM that lives on a different host than a, another VM. So anti-affinity rule for a v, per VM. But you don't have the VM information on the API level, if I understand only the host information and the mapping of the right. VM to the uh, cells. The API, yes, Nova API only has access to the database at Nova API, which only knows about that information, but the, the Nova scheduler is still gonna be privy to all of that information. It's still, right now what happens is there's a mechanism in place so that Nova computes, say, these are all the instances that I have, and they pass that information up to the scheduler and that's not going to change at this point. So all of your hosts across all of your deployment are still telling the scheduler everything. Now, real quick, I will say, you know, there are people in Sales V1 that really like this two-level architecture, or may want it for scaling, or because they don't want to change the filters and weights that they already have. So there's talk about changing the scheduler to kind of work that way, but what would happen, I think, is that the scheduler API would not change. And so for most people, if they wanna do global scheduling across all of their hosts, they could continue to do that. The people who want this two level scheduling would actually plug it in in the same place. Um, and instead of calling the scheduler twice, you would have Nova API, the conductor call to the scheduler, and then it would make a decision and call to a sub-scheduler. Um, but from the Nova perspective, it looks exactly the same. Yes. Uh, so you mentioned the uh, uh, the assumption on Neutron of uh, assuming a flat network. Uh, so from a scalability point of view, uh, the cells sort of solves the scalability of computer Nova. Is there a co-design with Neutron to do similar kind of segregation and scaling? Can you elaborate a little bit more on how that will happen? There's not, as far as I know, a plan for Neutron to scale its database or any messaging system in the same way that Nova has done. Uh, I think Neutron right now is more focused on scaling, um, I guess what you'd call the data plane for that side and making it so you can have, you know, your, your actual physical networks be segregated in such a way and scale those. Your broadcast domain is a little bit smaller than being, you know, totally global. Uh, however, I'm not at this point aware of any effort they've gone to to do the same type of um, message queue or database sharding that we are. There, there's been initial talks of conversation, but I don't think they're in a place to really push on that yet. So, so we can assume that in the future, may cell may somehow map to the network topology that, you know, that is created by Neutron. So Neutron sees all the cells the same as one sort of giant pool of yes. Nova nodes. Yes. Um, there, their concept right now is what they're calling I think, routed networks or segmented networks. Um, and those, it's actually flexible enough that you don't have to map it to a cell in particular, but I, I suspect most people are because their physical deployment you know, infrastructure is gonna look very much the same on the compute side and the networking side. Um, but again, there, it's just about kind of scaling the broadcast domains there, not tying, not making the Neutron deployment similar to the Nova Cells deployment. And we, we are actually, in any of the discussions we've had with Neutron, we're trying very hard to make it so that Neutron doesn't have to follow what Nova does in terms of Cells architecture. We want them to be very free to do what they want to do. 
Uh, hi, two questions. Um, you mentioned the aggregates, so host aggregates, server groups, all that is moving into the API database? Host aggregates are, um, I don't know about server groups, to think on that. Um, I'm not sure yet, is what I'll say. If it makes sense to do it, um, it will. There was a, a very specific reason we moved host aggregates and had something to do with, I'm trying to remember now. Um, basically, we need it, we use, we're using host aggregates as a way to map into this new concept of resource pools, which is getting into some very low level details of Nova, but that's actually what's gonna be used to tie into Neutron, um, to be able to make the segmented networks and Nova cells work together and also do a whole lot of other nice things for the Nova scheduler. Um, so aggregates are a way to map that. If server groups don't need to be used for anything like that, they may end up living within the cells database. It's for affinity and anti-affinity, so I think if the global scheduler is gonna allow affinity and anti-affinity, you're gonna have to have those up there. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it's one I haven't actually looked at specifically. Um, but again, if the data is available to the scheduler from within that child cell, um, from within that database, or if it's pushed up to the scheduler, it, it's kind of one of those things where we want to balance not putting too much information within the API database. So if we don't need to push it up, we won't. However, if it ends up that we need it for some reason, we'll, we'll do it. I just don't know for that one specifically. Okay, the, and the, my other question, uh, you just mentioned a little bit ago that uh, compute nodes were gonna report up to the global scheduler about capacity, about what instances are in, on each host, uh, just like in the normal, uh, in the current architecture. Um, and my question there is, is about scaling. Uh, is each compute node then gonna have a connection up into the global, uh, or you said there is no global message queue. So I guess the question is, how do those compute nodes communicate that information up to the schedule? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know that I have an answer for that yet. Um, I, so getting into more of a long story, I will say the direction ultimately is that the Nova scheduler is going to kind of get split off to the side where it's gonna have its own database and its own message queue. And it's really gonna kind of be like separated from Nova. Even if it's not pulled out as a separate project on its own, we're trying to separate it as much as possible. So we may end up with a message queue that has to run just for the scheduler in order to continue passing that information up. Um, that's maybe one of those unknown unknowns that now is a known unknown. Okay, thanks. I forget when this goes to, but we might be at time. Okay, cool. Thank you, everybody.